So before we get started, I just wanna say a massive thank you to everyone who's pre-ordered my new book so far. It's coming out the 5th of September. It's called Space, The 10 Things You Should Know. And everybody who pre-ordered it has already managed to get it bumped up to the top of Amazon's bestseller list at some point last week, which was absolutely incredible. Just to answer a couple of questions that I've seen that people have had in the comments. Yes, I am gonna be narrating the audiobook myself and I'm very excited for the day that I'm gonna go record that and I'll update you all on YouTube stories when I do. Second of all, like the hardcover physical version of the book will eventually be available to pre-order like in the US and Australia and outside of the UK. Um, the publishers are just sort of working behind the scenes to get all that sorted in terms of like working with US publishers, Australian publishers, etc. Um, so as soon as those links become available, I will put them in the description below so that you can go and pre-order those as well. Until then, you can always order the ebook if you want as well. So without further ado, let's get into this Night Sky News for May 2019. <laughs> As always with Night Sky News, let's start by looking up to the sky and thinking about what we can see for the next one. Okay, so this one's for the notification squad because this is gonna be something that you can see tonight, like Wednesday night, Thursday morning, the 22nd and 23rd of May, there is a conjunction of Saturn with the moon. So this is gonna be really early in the morning on Thursday the 23rd, right before dawn, you're gonna be able to see Saturn right next to the full moon. It's gonna be about 30 arc minutes away from the full moon, which is about the distance of the full moon in the sky again. If you have binoculars somewhere in your house, dig them out from wherever they are buried, you should be able to see the sort of telltale golden color of Saturn and maybe even spot one of Saturn's moons as well. Unfortunately, the rings are a little faint to see in binoculars, but if you have a telescope, why not crack that out this morning as well? Then as we get into early June, on the 5th of June in the evening, so this is one sort of for your night hours rather than your early morning people, we're gonna have Mars getting very close to the moon as well. This time the moon is gonna be a really thin crescent and Mars is gonna be a little bit further away, so it'll be sort of three thumb widths away from the moon. Um, again, really nice uh, thing to spot in the sky, the bright red planet next to a crescent moon. Again, this isn't one for us in the UK here. This is gonna happen in the constellation of Gemini, which is one of the ones on the ecliptic that the sun passes through. It's May, June. The sun is gonna be in Taurus, very close to Gemini. So it's gonna happen right after sunset, quite low on the horizon. So the closer you are to the equator for this one, actually the better. Also in the UK, you know, we're getting into sort of the longest days here and actually getting very close to the summer solstice. And at our latitudes, even, you know, sort of the entirety of the UK, for about 20 days or so in the summer, we never actually get into what's classified astronomically as nighttime. We're only ever in astronomical twilight. So you have civil twilight, nautical twilight, then you have astronomical twilight, and then full on nighttime, which basically means you can then do professional astronomy observing because the sky is still not sort of half lit by the sun anymore. And it's divine as when the sun drops 18 degrees below the horizon. And so that never actually happens in the summertime for us in the UK. So the glow of the sky is gonna be quite bright for us in the next couple of weeks. But on the 10th of June, Jupiter is actually going into what we call opposition. It means it's directly opposite the sun in the sky. It's at its closest point to Earth in its orbit. And it's a great time to catch it in the sky because it's generally extremely bright and also visible throughout the entire night as well. So it's gonna be in the constellation of Ophiuchus, which is this 13th constellation on the ecliptic or the zodiac that I was talking about in last week's video, uh, debunking horoscopes, which was weird for me, but still fun. Again, break out some binoculars, see if you can see any of those Galilean moons, Io, Ganymede, Europa, Callisto. It depends where they are in their orbits, if you can see all four of them. Some of them might be tucked away behind Jupiter, but also look out for the stripes on Jupiter as well, that are those storm clouds of gas whirring around through Jupiter. There's also gonna be a meteor shower from the same constellation late this month, the Ophiuchids meteor shower. But again, the further you are from the equator, the more you're gonna to struggle to see any. And even on the equator, there's only really predicted to be about five an hour or so. So if you do hear it hyped in the media, just be wary of that. You know, in the north up here, we're probably only gonna be able to see one an hour something like that. So maybe keep your eyes peeled if you are sort of out somewhere where you've got a great view of the night sky. If you do see a meteor, it could be from that shower, but otherwise I wouldn't necessarily go out specifically hoping to see some because you might be there waiting quite a while. So next up for night sky news is reflecting on all of the space news that's happened 
in the past month. Cast your minds back a couple of weeks and you remember that Israel tried to send a probe to the moon. It was going to be the first privately funded moon mission. And it was all started because of Google's Lunar X Prize that promised like a cash lump sum to the first team to make it to the moon. Uh, unfortunately, they crashed in their attempt. So the communications dropped out to the probe and the engine had to be restarted and they couldn't fire the thrusters to slow the craft down as it descended to the surface. And unfortunately, it ended up hitting the moon at quite a large speed back on April 11th. So they had to announce that unfortunately they had lost contact with the probe. So then NASA's Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter ended up searching the expected impact site to see if it could see any difference in the imaging from before and after the crash. So the impact site was thought to be the Sea of Serenity, which is if you look at the moon and you can see the man in the moon, it's the man in the moon's left eye or right as we look at it. So the LRO did manage to find the impact site and you can really clearly see that sort of white impact halo around the darker impact site and even that sort of tail uh, that follows it that actually is very consistent with the angle and trajectory that we think that the craft came in on from its last communication as well. So this was spotted on April 22nd by the LRO as it went about 90 kilometers above the surface. And the one thing to know is that there isn't actually a visible crater in the image. Now that could be for one of two reasons. It could be that the LRO was just orbiting too high up to be able to spot the crater at that distance, or it could just be that because the lander was pretty small, you know, maybe see a meter across or so, it didn't really leave a full on crater, but just more of like a dent in the surface. Now if you cast your minds back, you remember that we lost opportunity at the end of last year to a giant planet-wide dust storm on Mars. And so this paper by Van der Letaal that came out at the end of April was saying perhaps the two things are linked. Perhaps these global dust storms are actually also responsible for the reason that Mars no longer has that much water. So we know there is water on Mars. A lot of it is in ice that's trapped at the polar ice caps, but there's also some water vapor in the atmosphere on Mars that we've detected too. But then we've also detected by studying the geology of Mars, signatures that water once did flow there. The same that we see on Earth, where you have sort of water carving out riverbeds and through rocks. We have the same evidence for water flow on Mars, but the question is, you know, where did that water go? So this paper suggests that the global dust storms might actually be responsible for this. So the storms start in the same way that storms do on Earth. The sun heats the air just above the surface. That hot air rises and takes with it a lot of the dust from the planet's surface, but also could be taking water vapor from down near the lower altitudes up to the higher altitudes as well. And this paper detected that before the storm, there was your typical concentration of water vapor sort of below 40 kilometers in altitude. And then during the storm, that then peaked at much higher altitudes, sort of between 40 and 80 kilometers. High up in the atmosphere though, you're much more exposed to sunlight and sunlight can cause water to what we call dissociate. So stop being H2O and just go back to being oxygen and hydrogen atoms instead. If that happens, you've then just got very light molecules high up in the atmosphere that can be very easily lost to space. And so because of the detections that Van der Letaal make, they make this hypothesis that global wide dust storms that happen every three years or so, can cause water to be lost from near the surface to high into the atmosphere and then eventually into space. And this could explain why water may have once flowed on Mars, but no longer does. So the next thing I wanna talk about is the Planetary Defense Conference that happened in Washington DC in the first week of May. And what they did was get together experts in astronomy, astrophysics, uh, space exploration, people who are experts in dealing with emergency situations, politicians, everybody to discuss what we would actually do in the case of an asteroid threat. So what NASA's JPL did was come up with this hypothetical scenario where they knew sort of this exact orbit of this hypothetical asteroid and they knew what it was gonna be and they knew how it was gonna play out from now over the next decade. And what they did was say, okay, we've spotted it in the sky with our current telescopes and our best guess for what's gonna to happen to this asteroid is that there's a 1% chance of it hitting the Earth in 2027. And this was sort of their day one, this is what they were told. And it was sort of over the week, it was as the scenario played out, everyone then had to change, you know, what was the best thing to do as this scenario played out. And I would have loved to have been a fly 
on the wall during that whole conference because I bet it would have been fascinating. Fascinating, but also like a little bit of relief that at least people are thinking about this ahead of time so that we can be prepared for something like this as well. And I guess I imagined it playing out like a scene from Bandersnatch, you know, the Black Mirror film where the participants of the conference, they're like, evacuate NYC, nuke the asteroid. And they're like, which one do I pick? Some of you might have seen us on Twitter because Issa made the very brave decision to actually live tweet this conference with just a hashtag saying like exercise or like fictional event and all of the documents that they gave out that were like press releases just had exercise in massive red letters on them as well so that people wouldn't freak out and think that it was a real event but obviously it was Twitter. So people did freak out when they saw those tweets uh, and eventually realized that no, it wasn't a real threat to the earth. Um, so I feel like I should probably do the same thing because I feel like if people fall asleep maybe and then this video shuffles on and they wake up and hear me talking about an asteroid that's gonna impact with the earth, they might freak out. <coughs> So we're gonna do the same thing. We're just gonna have exercise in massive red flashing letters the entire time I talk about this. Okay, I don't like that. <laughs> that just makes me feel really guilty for not going to the gym lately. Let's do something else. Fictional event. Okay, I can deal with that. <laughs> that is nice enough. So on day one of the conference, they were told this asteroid had been spotted and from the observations we currently have, which are not that great because we have only seen it a couple of times, we know that it might have 1% chance of hitting the earth in about eight years or so. What do you do? And obviously everyone then discussed what the best course of action would be. So that on day two, they then had a press release to say, well, okay, this is what we decided. But then also NASA JPL updated them to say, right, okay, day two, it's now July, 2019. And they said the observations over the past four months as the asteroid has got slightly closer to Earth and we could see it because it brightened more, we've been able to refine our estimates and actually find there's a one in 10 chance of it hitting the Earth in 2027. They're still uncertain on the size because they've not seen it in radar yet. It's not been close enough to do that, but it's probably about 140 to 260 meters wide. And therefore an impact would release maybe about 100 to 800 megatons and cause serious damage on the Earth. At least it would be localized damage. It wouldn't be like a global sort of catastrophe where you know, like dust would block out the sun and everything. It would be very localized, but still, a threat. So by day three, which is supposed to be December 2019, you find out that the delegates back in July decided that they should send a reconnaissance mission to the spacecraft to determine its mass, its size, its density, and its orbit much, much better. So they had much better science to go off. So that by day three, JPL are telling them, okay, because you've done that, you found out that actually impact is certain and it's gonna hit Denver, Colorado in April, 2027. <laughs> So it's like, what do you do now, delegates? Okay, well, they decide to send two more reconnaissance missions to constantly track this asteroid's progress at all times, so that we constantly have information about it. In the meantime, let's get NASA, ESA, JAXA, China Space Agency, Russia Space Agency to all work together to build what will essentially be like a deflecting mission. And essentially what they decide to do is send up six spacecraft that would just impact with the asteroid and then that exchange of momentum would slowly change the asteroid's trajectory ever so slightly and push it away from Earth. Now that's great but obviously that assumes that all those space agencies are willing to work together and also to pay to do that when in essence it is actually just going to hit the US, it's going to hit Denver. So that all brings the politicians into play as well, especially because the delegates also say, well, those reconnaissance missions, we better just put maybe a nuke on one of those in case this redirection plan goes wrong and we can then just maybe blow up the asteroid as like a last resort. So the politicians really do step in here because if you start launching a nuke on a rocket in a spacecraft, are you violating a load of like international treaties, etc.? So that's why they're there to sort of try and hash that out as well. So then by day four, which is supposed to be September 2024, NASA and JPL tell them, okay, the deflector mission mostly worked. However, when one of the spacecraft deflectors impacted with the asteroid, quite a large chunk broke off. So now the main asteroid is not going to hit Earth anymore, but that chunk still is and your reconnaissance missions that were out there monitoring the asteroid caught all that and caught all the images and so we can see the, how wide it is and we can see that it's still about 100 meters wide again 
very localized threat to somewhere on Earth. And again, they're not entirely sure on this new chunk of asteroids trajectory, but basically it's going to hit somewhere either from the Atlantic Ocean all across the eastern and central US. They're all at risk. I'm wondering whether the people at NASA JPL watched Deep Impact before they came up with this scenario because it's starting to sound very similar to me. <laughs> so you might think, well, we've still got that rendezvous craft with the possible nuke on it, right? We could still nuke that little chunk of asteroid that broke off. But unfortunately, all that international discussion and politics broke down. That didn't work a nuke never went on that reconnaissance craft. So now there's emergency nuke plans being discussed by the delegates all day saying, well, can we now debate whether we can send one up anyway? Because if it hits the Atlantic Ocean, that's gonna be a tidal wave scenario and that's gonna imp impact a lot more people than if it's a localized impact on the US. And so those discussions then take place as well, whilst also having contingency plans for evacuation of like most of the Eastern Seaboard that's at risk. So that by day five, it's supposed to be like 10 days before the actual impact. And JPL have been like, right, we now know that the actual impact site will be Central Park in New York, which I think they knew that from the beginning because that seems a little bit coincidental to me. But they now know that it's gonna hit the atmosphere with a 19 kilometers per second speed, which is about 43,000 miles an hour. It's incredibly fast. And when it hits New York City, even though the asteroid itself is only about 80 meters across, the devastation will be incredible for miles and miles around. And they have released all of this sort of warning information about the time that the devastation is going to take to get from sort of the ground zero all the way out to New Jersey and also the sort of devastation that will follow as well. So all the delegates are now sort of discussing, okay, we need mass evacuation of most of New York, New Jersey and the surrounding area. And how do we go about doing that? You've also got to put like a blanket flight restriction in the impact zone as well, because you don't want anything being taken down out of the sky. And so obviously the focus is now on evacuation, which might sound pretty dire, but at least throughout this whole conference, they've been able to discuss, you know, possibility of sending a nuke up. They've been able to sort of implement the deflection method as well of the asteroid. And now obviously the people who focus on evacuation in these kind of events are also practicing what would happen if in the worst case scenario we weren't able to do anything before the impacts. So this might sound pretty far-fetched but in fact in April 2019 there's a near-earth asteroid that's going to pass incredibly close to the earth. We know it's not going to impact but we know that it's going to be very very close past. It's actually going to be within where our weather satellites orbit. So incredibly, incredibly bright in the sky. It's actually gonna be visible to the naked eye when that happens in 2029 as well, like during the day. It's about 340 meters in diameter. And so it would have a global sort of effect if it did impact with the earth, but thankfully it's not going to. It's got a less than one in 10,000 chance of that actually happening. So it is classed as potentially hazardous, but we know that at the minute from our observations that have been repeat observations, that, that probably won't happen. So the takeaways from this are that professional and amateur astronomers are constantly monitoring the sky for anything that moves that we haven't spotted before and constantly keeping a record of all of the near earth asteroids and we are on top of it and that there are people that are actually playing out what would happen around the world if something like this, like this did happen so that we can be prepared. You know, we might have you know, like eight years warning like this did. We might have decades warning perhaps if we do keep monitoring the sky, which thankfully there is money being put into programs that do do that. The other thing to take away from this is that although that deflection method of impacting uh, spacecraft into the asteroid to deflect it might sound a little bit like it was fiction, that is actually being put into effect by NASA and ESA in the coming months. So NASA has a mission called DART and ESA has a mission called HERA, both of which in the next two or three years are expected to launch and impact with an asteroid that is not a threat to Earth. It's not a near Earth asteroid, but impact the asteroid in order to determine if it did change the asteroid's orbit or trajectory uh, to test out whether this would be a feasible way of getting rid of such an asteroid threat to Earth. I hope you enjoyed this month's Night Sky News. Remember, all the links for everything I've talked about, papers and press releases are all in the description below. I would highly recommend going and reading all the Planetary Defense Conference stuff because it is great. The link for pre-ordering my book is also in the description below. So thank you again to all of you who did that. I will see you in next week's video. Until then, happy stargazing. 
And so this is the Sea of Serenity or Mer Serenitas. I can't say that in French. Don't even don't even attempt to say Mer Serenitas because you're just going to get it wrong. Apophis? Apophis. God, there was Ultima Thule news this week. And you know what? I just decided that I was just like, I'm not going to include it because I can't pronounce it. And now we've got Apophis. When was water first detected on Mars? You know, maybe I didn't even live through it. So how do I know when water was detected on Mars? Off the top of my head. Where is my phone? Phone. Yeah. 